the discussion on uh, snarky ceremonies. And I think uh, Misha will basically give the talk. And uh, we'll have 20 minutes of uh, slides and then maybe 25 minutes for presentation and then 35 minutes for discussion. Before before we start right away, like we want and need a note taker. So anybody who's here willing to take some notes, please do so. The link for the notes of the session are in the uh, links, ultimate list of links. So please bring it up. You can uh, text Abby, myself, or just say it uh, to everyone on the chat uh, if you're willing to, to take the lead in note taking. Thanks. All right. Sorry. Uh, tell me. Tell me if everything works here. It's good. All right. Because I have some crazy situation with my screens. Um, all right. And how this panel. Right. I did not quite expect this type of interface, but this should work. <clears throat> Do we have a note taker? Can I start? You can start. We'll make it sure we have a note taker for the right. discussion part. Right. Right. No problem. Okay. So. Um, Hello everyone, um, and and this uh, this is this is going to be a talk, um, a standard proposal kind of description for snarky ceremonies or for setup ceremonies for ZK snarks in general. Snarky ceremonies is, is, is a particular term that we're using for our work, but uh, for ceremonies in general. Um, yeah, but before anything else, I think I'm fine if people interrupt me and ask me questions in during the presentation. So I want to keep it kind of informal and maybe. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure I will be reading the chat. Uh, I think that's what I want to say, but I'm fine to take questions. Right, so let's let's go. Um, let's see, here we go. Okay, so uh, without discussing too much of the uh, kind of basic construction, so snark, so keep proofs, I'll uh, jump straight into the problem that we're trying to solve here. So uh, the problem of trusted setups. So we want to use the snarks, they have trust setup, what is it? Um, so we have the, the authority on the left, which has, has some trapdoor, some secret information that is used to be passed into the setup algorithm and as a result to obtain a CRS, so common reference string, or a structured reference string, so use SRS and CRS interchangeably here. And then this CRS is used for the parties to, for all the parties to uh, kind, of, kind of use from the outside for them to interchange messages and uh, you know, engage in all kind of communication patterns with respect to proving and verifying proofs. Um, and we, of course, know that this trapdoor, which is on the left generated by the authority, is toxic and it must be discarded. And if it's not, it can be used to simulate proofs and do all kinds of, all kinds of produce all kind of bait behavior in the protocols where the snark is used. So uh, there are several ways that we can, uh, several ways we can take to avoid this problem. So the first way would be to pick protocols in which we don't need public setup in a way. So if you have only the designated verifier, you can, um, you know, you can the, this verifier can generate an SRS and then you can prove things to this verifier without needing to set this ceremony up to set the sorry to set the um, public CRS up somehow. But the more classical and more popular way of solving this problem of process setup is of course the uh, Ryan MPC, which is called the ceremony. Uh, Talk really. So um, a few other options that we want to also take a look at is subversion resistance in general. So which properties do we still have when the CRS is broken? It's kind of adversarially controlled. Um, and also there are things along the lines of updatability and universality of SRS. And of course, transparent solutions, which you have if you use random Oracle, if you exit the plain model. So we'll talk about these things in the presentation. So first things first. What happens if we have an adversary who corrupts the CRS? Can we do something with it? So uh, yes, we can. Uh, the, the, there are two basically notions. So there is like a, a family of notions that's called subversion something. Um, so we are interested in, in subversion, subversion soundness and subversion zero knowledge. But there is a result that shows that you can actually come up with an argument that has either subversion soundness or subversion zero knowledge, but it is also a negative result in this if I've seen paper that shows you that you cannot have subversion soundness and zero knowledge. So unless we're fine with uh, witness negotiable proofs, 
um, we cannot achieve subversion sound. So this means that we cannot have any security guarantees unless we have some kind of special setup. Uh, in practice, subversion zero knowledge is actually uh, not too expensive. So it's quite uh, it's quite commonly found in snarks like Rothstein, Rothmalden, Sonic, and uh, elsewhere. And essentially what happens here is that uh, we create this algorithm, which is called the CRS verification procedure. And um, whenever the CRS verifies, we can say something, we can, we can um, have some security properties uh, from with this CRS. So in particular with the zero knowledge means we can create proof for the broken CRS in a way and it doesn't leak anything anyway. Um, so subversion is a case something that is uh, that will be kind of implicitly used in many places uh, throughout the presentation. And the MPC, which is the main focus of our presentation, is this you know very simple protocol. I mean, um, on the high level, we have uh, different parties with different parts of the trapdoor, so they somehow communicate using some specific protocol as if they have a you know one global trapdoor that is implicitly used to set up the uh the whole the whole argument and then the crs is is magically can produce by this protocol uh, the two main protocols that we can see in the literature i mean uh, two main families of protocols Stephen Burr would say uh are the following two so the first one is a more kind of a more standard protocol i believe in one of the first ones um that solved the problem of trusted setup so it's called secure sample of public parameters for uh 16tk proofs by Ben Sassen et al. And uh, it is generic, so it's not built for any particular kind of uh, snark. So it, it's 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 more like designed for a family of proofs of arguments. And one um, so one property and one disadvantage of it, that as, as it will be seen by the further works, is that it requires a pre-commitment phase and it requires parties to be available. Uh, so the first one means that whenever you want to participate in the ceremony, you must say, well, hello, everyone, I want to participate in the ceremony. In the beginning of the ceremony, you must, you must pre-commit to some data, and then you must really stick to the uh, process of this protocol. And if you want to abort at some point, then the, the whole procedure must abort. So it's not very, um, so this procedure cannot be scaled, it doesn't scale very well, so to say, because of this limitation. Uh, but nevertheless, this protocol was studied extensively, and there is so there is uh, this bulk absent green variant. So instantiation of this first protocol with Pinocchio used for um, uh, Zcash Sprout. Uh, yeah, and the snark there is the version zero knowledge. And there also exists an analysis of the security of this protocol um, for growth 16. So it's instantiated for growth 16. And then the second family, uh, second family of protocols based on the uh, BGM 17 works by Paul Gabbers and Mears, uh, is where most ceremonies that you can find um, kind of grow out of. And essentially, uh, it was originally designed for Gross 16, and it's uh, player exchangeable, meaning that it solves this problem that I mentioned with the first family. You can come and go as you please, um, more or less. And it scales fairly well. I mean, uh, if we ignore kind of more practical aspects, so with, with this respect, it scales fairly well. Uh, one artifact that it adds to the protocol is this uh, necessity for for the execution of random beacon. And a random beacon is something that we will discuss here uh, in the presentation further. But for now, I think it it suffices to say that it is a very kind of some, some kind of protocol that produces randomness. Uh, publicly verifiable and biased randomness that you want to use with the protocol. So it complicates the protocol a bit, but it also makes it more scalable. Uh, BGM 17 is two phased. It has two phases. The first one is universal. It doesn't have any specific relation that it works for. Uh, it's co commonly referred to as powers of tau because you square, so it, because you just generate the powers of uh, the X trapdoor, so to say. Um, and yeah, the security. Uh, of both protocols is holds as long as at least one party is honest. And in the second case, uh, one party should be honest in each phase. So then let's quickly focus on this, quickly discuss what BGM 17 protocol looks like. So we have the second, uh, sorry, we have this first phase, which is called universal. It's not, uh, it's not generated for any particular relation or any particular language. 
um, and we have a party which holds the first trapdoor, uh, generates some CRS, passes to the next party, and then continues on and on. And this is very it's, it's a strictly sequential procedure. So you, you really have slots, time slots in practice, right? And you have and you update the CRS using your local trapdoor. And you're supposed to get rid of this trapdoor because uh, whoever knows all the trapdoors uh, knows uh, can um, well can tag the system. And so as the end result, this CRS use first part of the CRS that is used uh, in the end. And then we specialize this CRS, kind of we specialize the MPC with a specific relation R and do the very same thing to obtain the CRS S. And essentially when we view both these parts together, we have the final CRS which can be used for the protocol. Yeah, all right, so now what is, this random beacon, which I mentioned. Um, essentially, as I said, it's kind of a protocol. It's, it's a, yeah, it's a protocol. It's a, yeah, protocol is a good name. So it's a protocol that uh, generates a periodical uh, unbiased randomness, which is public, verifiable, um, and yeah, available to everybody. So uh, the picture on the right goes like this. You have like, some timeline time and at certain you know, points and certain intervals of time, this protocol just uh, emits some random bits. Uh, how to construct this random beacon now? Um, well, one of the um, simple solutions is to take a verifiable delay function, uh, namely that a function that works for some time and can be verified later uh, to some public source of entropy. And uh, the most naive, I think, solution and robust solution is to take uh, some uh, Bitcoin block and hash it very many times. So. The idea here is that when you want to when you want to set up this random beacon procedure, when you want to get this uh, random value, you say, well, we will use the the output from some specific uh, block height, and then when this block is generated and it's hard to it's very hard and reasonably hard to predict the uh, hash of the block in the future, but then the fact that the VDF evaluation takes a significant amount of time, uh, more than usually the uh, um, the distance between two blocks. Uh, it makes it very hard to either predict this value or to bias it. And so essentially how this random beacon is used in the, B, uh, in the BGM17 protocol is that it is uh, it serves the place of the last participant of each phase. So essentially um, on this diagram, uh, mm -hmm. the parties would participate in this first universal phase and then uh, the team who organizes the uh, ceremony would say, would declare in advance, for instance, this Bitcoin block. And then we would run, the team would run the uh, the VDF, which is uh, SHA256 too many times, uh, to this hash of this block. And then this uh, resultant value will be used to the trapdoor. So it's kind of important to notice, I think, here that the random beacon, although the random beacon uh, is used as last party, it's still public. So if you have a scenario when there is only one contribution to a setup procedure to a phase, so only one contribution yet, and it's a dishonest contribution, so the adversary knows this value, and you add a random beacon to it, um, you still do not escape the attacks because adversary knows the its own trapdoor and the public value, so it can still attack the system. So it's not enough to apply random beacon uh, in a way to uh, have the security, but it unbiases the CRS. So whatever bias can adversary uh, introduce into the into the CRS, it can be slightly smoother, so to say. So let's maybe quickly uh, discuss the real world experience, they say. So what ceremonies have been there? Uh, it's a very it's a very high level interview. I think uh, over the last week I was trying to collect a, you know, a, a big amount of data about specifics of all these ceremonies. I think it's not a very uh, easy process and I will discuss it. Uh, in a, in a bit, but essentially, as I said, there are two big protocols. And the first one is the more classical one. And this was the one that um, the Zikesh Proud ceremony ran on. It has had six participants. It was well-documented. Um, yeah, and there are lots of protocols uh, that use BGM-17. So again, Zikesh Sapling MPC, which had 90 participants in each phase. Um, Yes, yeah, so one of the most, uh, I think, well-documented and easily accessible ceremonies that you can find. Uh, 
And Perpetual Powers of Tau is run, I think, by what is it? Ethereum Foundation C Labs originally. But the idea of this ceremony is that it only runs the first round, the first phase of the BGM 17 protocol. Since 2019, there are two variations of it for two different curves, so BN254 and BLS12. And it essentially goes kind of perpetually. Uh, there is no clear limit when this procedure is going to stop. If you want to use uh, the ceremony, the first phase for your uh, personal, your personal project, you just fork it at some point and then start the second phase from that. That's a very, that's a very interesting kind of uh, suggestion, very interesting approach to simplifying the ceremonies. And then there are many, many uh, ceremonies that use this perpetual powers of Tau, uh, including Falcoin, Semaphore, which we saw last year, uh, Loopring, Tornado Cash, which was, I think, popular by having more than uh, 1,000 participants, slightly more than 1,000, by using a light client and a Hermes. Um, there's also BGM 17 based ceremony uh, called Plamo. I think it's, uh, it's recently, uh, it's a very recent one. So I think it was uh, November, December last year. Uh, so if authors of the ceremonies can say something, I, if I say something wrong about the descriptions, please uh, don't be afraid to interrupt me and correct me. Uh, and yeah, also there is an Aztec ignition ceremony, which was also quite popular, but I think I couldn't fit it in either, either category because it uses range proofs. And although it was, it had 176 participants, um, yeah, it's, it's not categorizable between these two, but it's very similar to BGM 17 first phase, I would say. It has some type of kind of universality. Yeah, so let's get quickly back to random beacons uh, and how they were used in this ceremony. So as I said, one naive way, or maybe one simple way, better to say, is to take some Bitcoin block and then apply a Zcash does to, 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 to the 42 iterations of SHA-256. Uh, I do not have an exact amount of how long did it take, but I assume it's tens of hours. It's quite a quite an expensive computation. And the um, uh, caveat of this is that when you want to verify the ceremony, you need to verify this contribution as well. And it takes well proportionally uh, proportional amount of time to verify this computation. Right? There is no uh, way to make it uh, significantly faster. Uh, to solve this problem, there was one. Um, so, so, so semaphore ceremony tried to solve this problem, and they took a Ethereum block, which is not very different uh, conceptually, and apply tried to apply a VDF, which is based on uh, hidden group order. Um, yeah, so hidden group order VDF. So this is supposed to have. So this is not supposed. It has a fast verification, uh, comparing to the number of steps that you need to actually evaluate this function. Uh, but as far as I know, there exist certain reservations with uh, respect to security assumptions that are used um, for these types of PDF. Uh, and I'm not personally an expert on, on these types of PDFs. Um, then finally, there exist uh, random beacon protocols that are kind of dedicated. So they're, they're, they just exist, exist as, as multi-party computations or as separate protocols. For instance, DRAND that is used by Hermes uh, Hermes is a very recent, I think, ceremony that started to run March this year, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and then the final solution is we can ignore the random beacon, uh, which is maybe um, it's a very it's a very a contrasting solution to what I said before. But uh, for instance, Filecoin did that, and there is a very uh, kind of there is a very reasonable it's a very reasonable choice in a way because. Um, there actually exists an analysis by Mary Muller in 2018 showing that if we take the cross 16 and try to analyze the security in the generic group model, then the random beacon uh, is not strictly necessary. So this was referred to by several ceremonies, I think, as well. And, and this observation is starting point of our work. Um, so we call ceremonial snarks or snarky ceremonies to concepts in which we basically want to view the ceremony and the soundness experiment holistically. So we, in the recent work, we provide this framework that models these things together. And it's uh, somewhat less restricted than a UC definition, for instance, would be or MPC definition. Um, we proved GROSS16 plus BGM17 uh, ceremony securing this framework under uh, QDLock in AGM, so algebraic model and random oracle model. And what is important, we 
Uh, confirming the original analysis by Mary, we uh, removed the necessity of random beacons. So we, we, we say that the protocol is secure without them. We we'll also simplify the protocol a bit. And uh, additionally, we de develop, so our partner, GRNAT, develops an independent verification tool um, that we're supposed to run on the different ceremonies to, to evaluate the performance. And the intuition about this work is that we have the MPC, which I showed before. So that's the same type of MPC. Um, two, two phases, and then there is a CRS that is used for the soundness game. I would say that the um, SNARK is uh, update knowledge sound. If adversary cannot win, win the, knowledge, uh, the knowledge sound game, soundness game, even if it participated in the uh, MPC before that. So as long as this is negligible, the whole scheme is secure. So that's the holistic approach that, um, that I mentioned. To quickly, maybe really quickly go into the detail to then continue to more general topics. Uh, what we basically do is that we add to the knowledge sound this game, the one, just one step where adversary interacts with the Oracle called the, um, well, SRS update Oracle. And then the adversary in each phase uh, issues this update queries, which um, produce honest update on the SRS. And then in, each, in the end of each phase, adversary finalizes the SRS that it um, obtains. Essentially, the, the, the thing here is that we want to model uh, the presence of one honest update in each phase. And for that, adversary can do whatever it wants, but it also needs to use this Oracle to update the SRS. And then it plays the standard knowledge on this game. Yeah, all right. So I think, so yeah, maybe it's just my personal opinion, but I think we have, um, Somewhat, somewhat theoretical sound understanding of how ceremonies work, at least the protocols which are used, uh, which are used in the ceremonies right now. Uh, and at the same time, we already have a big kind of a big, um, uh, so quite a, quite a huge set of accumulated practical knowledge about how the ceremony should be done from the organizational standpoint, from the security standpoint, and from from many different aspects. Mm -hmm. And the question here is uh, what we can improve really in what we can improve in. Um, in all the ceremonies that are to be run. So uh, from the personal experience of analyzing this, uh, the uh, kind of code bases and attestation repositories and so on of the ceremonies that are available, I can say that one thing is that all these uh, approaches are, although they're usually based on the same protocol there, and they're also they're all try to be very transparent, I think very successfully, they're still very heterogeneous. And sometimes to find a, a very specific bit of information takes a really long time. Uh, sometimes not obviously in the readme.md and, and so on. So it takes quite a lot of uh, steps to actually understand what are the specifics of the particular ceremony if you're an outsider. And given that it is supposed to be the case that uh, external people should be able to come to the repository and quickly verify, okay, maybe not quickly, but to perform some Verification, certain verification of the of the ceremony to make sure that it's correct, um, and I think many parties and many ceremonies write their verifiers and try to simplify this process as 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 it is possible. Uh, I think it would definitely benefit from a more kind of a more specific, a more standardized, um, a more homogeneous type of um, well type of verification procedure, and that is why. Uh, this is why we are uh, thinking about writing an independent uh, verification tool to kind of measure different ceremonies. And, and yeah, so yeah, okay, so this slide basically repeats what I just said. So we have uh, most of these solutions are uh, have independent code base, uh, except maybe for this repository, which is uh, used for perpetual powers of Tau, is forked many times and modified many times, I think. Uh, so I'm not sure whether it's used in the uh, in its original way or with many modifications. I think in some cases there are many modifications that are applied to it. And yeah, and there is this tool which we are writing at, at the time. And so from this, I think I will kind of gradually, I will gradually switch to the discussion section. So I'll still kind of discuss this slides in the next one, but um, I think it's it's a good time to start asking questions. So basically, my, my first thing which I want to kind of point out is that it maybe makes sense to uh, think about how uh, how the content and descriptions of the ceremonies can be made more uniform. But that's only one 
one suggestion that we can make. So before everything else, what is already available in the ZKP com ref uh, 0 0.2? Um, basically two things. So we have a description of examples of setup and trust. And it's a small section that says, well, we can have trans uh, transparent setup, we can have trusted setup, we can have a uniform uh, reference link, or it can be structured. And there is a small uh, small kind of bullet that says we can use MPC or different approaches to tackle the fact that trusted ceremony should so trusted setup shouldn't be used for public uh, product. And there is a second section which is much more elaborate. Uh, so it actually describes mostly, as it says, real world social and technical problems behind the generation of SRS. It mentions many concepts that I said, uh, but fairly uh, concisely. And I, I would say that. The biggest uh, part that takes most place in this section is the description for the description of practical kind of aspects, caveats, and important points to look at. So when you want to organize a ceremony, what what things do you should should you keep in mind? It's not it's not very. I don't think it's a very structured description, but it's still very good. So it says like you know buy a computer from some random store and then have air gaps and. Um, you know, don't let anyone to see your RAM, destroy your RAM afterwards, uh, have a big committee, have as many participants as possible. So really a list of good like best practices. And yeah. And I think this is the this is my last slide, which is uh, basically um, not a list of discussion points, which is a different one, but I think a list of concrete problems that we can think about for uh, right now. So as I said, we have this, um, we confirm the fact that we don't really need random beacons from the standpoint of at least algebraic group model proof and in the DGM proof before as Mary showed. So given that it's sometimes quite, uh, quite a complicated procedure to set up random beacon, what do we really need to do with them? So how, how do people feel about random beacons in general? Uh, then again, transparent setups. So somebody can say, well, uh, ceremonies are of course good, but maybe we should just move away from that. And that's a very good discussion points as well. So I think it doesn't match with my personal uh, feeling, but um, it could be a very reasonable question. Uh, then, as I said, it, the ease of comparison of ceremonies and simpler verification. So they're transparent, but they're not very kind of e extremely easy to verify. It takes, still takes computational resources and still takes, um, well, just, just, just mental resource to understand what's happening. And one thing they, would explicitly like to learn from people who are maybe here who were organizing the ceremonies is what is your personal experience and what can we learn from this uh, past ceremonies? And although I, I, I did find some of these answers, some, some of the answers to these last questions uh, on the internet, I think still very, very valuable. So I think many people said that organizing ceremony is quite a complicated process. Um, and uh, I'm not sure. So maybe I would like to see people who are more or optimistic or pessimistic about um, how this can be done, how can it be simplified, and what is the future of all this. Um, and yeah, thank you. I think this is concludes my slide section. Thank you, Misha. Um, <clears throat> I just before we continue into the conversation and we ask questions and, and you know definitely get to talk to all of, about all of these topics. Is there anyone who can take some notes today? This would be super helpful so that we can keep track of the discussion and, and it would, oh, uh, have done. Okay, so JB, um, do, you, do you have access to the HackMD? Wait, so uh, JB, do you, do you, uh, can you maybe unmute yourself for a second? Do you have access to the HackMD? That's where we would like to be having the notes maybe others can also ask. Um, the, the link I've, I've written i've wrote them out um i've got two pages here uh, it seems like keywords and um i wish mm. i was taking more of the words that weren't said through the presentation though um but i tried to do a bit more at the end and i kind of missed a few bits but i can give what i've got and that's what i've got and you can have it oh thank you thank you so much is it written notes that's the, that's what you were saying it is, yeah. It handwritten? Okay, okay. Uh, is there a chance that you could uh, at least uh, scan them or something later and, and maybe put them as a picture or 
I mean, if you feel like typing them, then that's that's so good. Uh, yeah, I can uh, I can send them. Uh, people might have issues with re uh, reading it, but uh, I can uh, take a photo. Um, I, I can't type immediately, uh, but I can take a photo in the meantime, and then. Uh, okay. Yeah, I think it's best not to commit to something, but just do it. Yeah. You know, and not say it because I find that affects it. <laughs> so, like, but for now, I'll take pictures. Okay, we, we would still like to have a note taker on the hack and if, if that's possible, because it helps uh, go through the, through things. So if, if anybody's up for it, uh, please do it. And that's that's the last thing I'll say about that. So, um, Gabby, do you want to? So what's the, the protocol for, uh, do we want to do race hands or? Um, Maybe people type. can unmute themselves with questions, and if there is conflict, then uh, we can moderate. And if there is a lot of questions, then raise hands. Makes sense. Um, so, so Misha, thank seems you the for most your, natural way. Thank you for your talk and your overview. Um, I guess I have. I'll ask the first question, maybe, which is: uh, if you go back a few slides, um, there, right there. Next slide. Right, this one. You said theoretically we understand the ceremonies fairly well. I think I want to take a contention. Uh, I, I want to sort of poke on that statement. Um, yeah. I'm not sure I understand. Uh, so is it just um, the standard MPC definition? It sounds like you have a number of other properties that are not well formalized um, for these things. Is there a UC definition of the ceremony you're talking about? Or Yeah, so... Um... Yeah, that's a good question. So this is my personal opinion, right? So um, this is not a kind of a overarching statement. Um, I think what I try to say here, okay, before everything else, we have a UC uh, proof for the first uh, generation of ceremonies. Um, so I think it's uh, by Abdul Maliki et al. Um, we don't have a UC proof for the second one. I think what I was going to say is that the current, uh, it's hard for me to imagine anyone uh, making a kind of groundbreaking discovery in how the ceremonies can be improved. That's what I, I tried to say. So, um, yeah. So it seems that we have at least several types of uh, different proofs for the BGM 17 ceremony, which is currently used. And I think this ceremony at least is uh, understood fairly well to some extent. Yeah. The security properties of it. I mean, I guess what I hear when you talk about what you want in this and sort of like all the different mechanisms that have been deployed, it's not clear to me that all of the properties that you want in a ceremony are well understood. Um, yeah, not the, okay, not the properties, yes. I think most of the, so, so you're talking about the security properties, properties with respect to the SNARK setup? Not even just the security properties. Like, I guess you, you for example, you mentioned uh, verifiability. Like mm -hmm. a nice property would be sublinear time verification of the, you know, public verifiability of yes. the transcript after. Like, is that something that's formalized? No. So that's actually a very, a very on point comment because that's something that we, I think I wanted uh, to discuss. I think uh, it was one of, one of the Mary's ideas to, uh, also consider simplifying the uh, simplifying the verification procedure of the ceremony so that uh, you know we can you can have much more easy uh, more, much more lightweight verification of the of the transcript of the protocol. All right, yeah. So please interpret this. Is it's it seems that the statement is more general than perhaps it should have been. Um, what I say is that current current BGM seventeen as it is run, uh, we don't. I, I don't uh, think that there are any other. Kind of properties that we or discoveries about it that we can have. I'm not talking is about BGM, the extensions. Yeah. Is BGM 17 in the honest majority setting or the n minus one setting? Uh, n minus one. Okay. So the so, previous. So how do you yeah. deal with the abort problem? Like uh, again, I, I don't know anything about this area. So. Yeah. So there is no problem with abort because the it's sequential. So. Um, what happens in reality is that you have a coordinator, which is either automatic or is just a person who uh, invites participants, sorry, to invite participants to uh, kind of contribute their trapdoor. And uh, essentially the participant takes their, takes their hardware and then uh, downloads some, some, some data, which is this previous CRS, updates it with a trapdoor and outputs the new CRS. So if participant just aborts, then 
the coordinator can say, well, your slot time has expired, so we move on. And then the CRS can be used for the next participant. Mm -hmm. So the it's, it's, it's iterative, it's sequential, and it can be run perpetually as is done in the professional powers of tile. So any participant, so these participants do not, must not be the same even. So it just, uh, so the Did requirement that is that- problem actually kind of does come into it a little bit. I think if you're trying to parallelize the work, so like how most of these things work is you have one person participate and then the next and then the next and then the next, and this is actually quite slow. And there have been sort of ideas about the, maybe we could have four people all participating at the same time. But then the problem there is that if one person does abort, all of those four contributions are lost. So it's sort of, yeah, it's avoided because it's sequential. Uh, so Mary, in this case, how would how would like let's say you had two parallel chains, like the top one and the bottom one? How do you then combine the two at the end? You can't. Okay. Yeah, the point is that coordinator tries to kind of avoid situations where you have forks. Well, so I mean, this is a natural question, right? Can you get can you get um, so already the theoretical question I would ask here is that. You're in the n minus one setting. Uh, you want uh, basically you're you're okay doing um, you know participant ejection. Essentially, you identify a cheater and you eject them from the ceremony and continue uh, in order to in order to make progress. Uh, the question is, can you do this like um, at least uh, in the honest in the optimistic case? Can you do it in less than n rounds? And so I don't know if that's I don't know if that's possible. Like obviously there's an example here that you could do it in N, um, but those are the type of questions which I think this uh, ceremony. Like first of all, it's a sampling ceremony. Like you're sampling from a, you know, nobody really has a private you know input so much. So it's it's sampling versus com computation of a function for MPC, and uh, but you want like guaranteed output delivery, you know, subject to the N minus one. So it's interesting. I don't think. Um, I'm hoping there's some MPC questions that could could emerge uh, from this problem setting. So I don't think we have any. Uh, so as far as I know, we don't have any negative kind of strong negative results on this. Yeah. So I would I would I would guess that yeah I would guess that it's I, I don't have any intuition about that. Maybe there is something possible here as an extension or as a different protocol. Yeah. So for example, another theoretical property is that at any point, I guess maybe this is a perpetual tau thing. Mm. Um, I don't know how that works. Maybe it continues like this where everybody just keeps adding. The point is that you can cut the protocol at any point and you have an output, which yes, is kind that's... of like these uh, bandit, you know, so, so there, in algorithms, people study that property as well, that like you always have an answer. Um, so that's another like thing to be formalized and that's exactly what perpetual powers of tau does. Yeah. So essentially, you have like a first phase, which is for now has some seventy contribute contributors, and you can come to it at any point of time. You can say, well, we're starting from sixty five, and you will fork it from sixty five here, and continue the second phase. So uh, each CRS output here is has the same form, and it can be used as the first part. And what what I find interesting about Salmon is that it is. It's a kind of it's a it's a protocol, an MPC protocol that has been picked up multiple times by different groups, and uh, and they they had to implement it and figure out how it works. So I think there's a lot of practical experience, and sometimes this was done with in kind of in, in collaboration with theoreticians, but sometimes maybe without. So so I'm curious whether there were challenges in kind of implementing a a, a ceremony that what kind of would, would, would practitioners want better documentation from the theorists? What were the challenges? So that's, that's what kind of I find interesting because that is maybe where standardization could come in and, uh, and make things easier when making yet, yet another ceremony. So uh, I'm, I'm particularly interested in kind of practitioners kind of saying what was really challenging here. For example, like DDoS, like uh, did it, did anybody see? Um, now I, I'm sure these ceremonies are, are published. 
did did anybody basically see like BGP level attacks to try to you know uh, isolate any of the public participants? So I'm personally not aware of any, but I think what what kind of communication mode just to just to make it sure uh, make it more precise the communication here which happens so that you really for a big circuit if you have a big circuit it usually is the case you really just get one file uh, securely over I, I wouldn't guess what the protocol is but like you know FTP or SSH or something uh, or sync you just really download one big file and then you perform some computation on it and then send it back so there is not too much uh, network. Uh, communication happening and then um there's a centralized hub right you're saying it's stored on github or somewhere or um, yeah i think the data is stored on the github because it's extremely big it's uh, tens of uh, gigabytes uh but i think it's stored in some dedicated server that is yeah a cloud cloud server uh but i think the the the, the thing here is that the so are you talking about availability attacks so you can you can maybe isolate a person from yeah executing his code but that's yeah so that's I mean, the fact I, that correctness I guess though. The order here, TD one, two, three, four, five, like that has to be published. And I guess if I want to inspect it, I can find out like that uh, Markov is like slot 57. And so I wait, you know, until slot 56. And then I figure out, I know, I know kind of where he lives. So I just like target, uh, target his, his cable modem, <laughs> do something like that, or, or just actually turn off a big chunk of, uh, you know, disconnect a, a chunk of the internet with uh, BGP hijacking attacks or something like that around him. So I, I would, I was, I'd be curious, those attacks are, people do that with Bitcoin, <clears throat> or at least there's work on showing how <clears throat> there are these it, type of weird BGP routes that get announced. So I wonder if, uh, if ceremonies have seen that. As far as I'm aware, they haven't. Um, hmm. So I think that for the Aztec one, and if there's anyone here from Aztec Diesels would pipe up, they were trying to do a very, very, very long um, reference string. So because there was very, very high prover overhead and because there was very high um, network overhead, they had situations where parties weren't being attacked. There was nothing malicious going on, but they did get timed out because they just weren't able to compute the protocol within their time slot. But I don't know of any examples where people were actively targeted in order to stop them participating. So may maybe as an anecdote here in a paper I wrote, um, uh, Mining for Privacy on, on how to do these types of ceremonies over, over blockchains with the, with the miners, we did have to actively consider uh, timing as well. So it's it's quite important to make sure that you get the timings right to make sure that uh, denial of service isn't possible. But I, I it, the, this kind of level of distributed denial of service, I, I'm not sure if it's a feasible attack either, because you might be able to target some of the participants. But if you want to act, actually attack a ceremony, there's sort of two goals you can have. You either try to subvert the reference string or you try to um, break trust in the ceremony. And it's hard to do, well, it, it might be possible to break trust with a denial of service attack, but it's a, very hard to break, um, uh, to, to break the security if you can only target a, a handful of the participants, for instance. Yeah, uh, but I, I would consider that a let's let's imagine the following attack right uh i just want to yeah I, I want to reduce trust in the ceremony and thus i want to basically kick out like five of the people five of the 70 people who you know participate so they actually get the string they compute and then somehow they're simply unable to or, or even from their perspective they're able to upload but uh let's say the actual uh, the, the next recipient, like U3 thinks that they've uploaded their, their, their contribution, but U4 believes that they have basically timed out because, you know, as it is, this protocol isn't done over consensus, right? That people don't agree about what time U3 has submitted their response, at least from this communication diagram. And thus, you know, U4 yeah. takes, you know, starts from U2, U3 believes U4 should have started from, from U3. Why so, isn't that so an issue? 
I think so. I think one main thing which is makes it slightly less of an issue is that each computation usually takes hours. And so what happens is that if the okay for for most ceremonies which are not fast, I think tornado cache was fast. Other ceremonies were not fast. And if it's not fast, then you can have uh, all the time in the world to, to go to chat, Telegram chat and then write the coordinator. I couldn't upload this, and then you will be probably given another slot. And so if you want to participate, probably it's really hard for you to stop the person from participating, unless you will get extremely frustrated over somebody actively attacking you. Uh, but actually, well, sorry. Informal uh, rules, right? Like I think it having would, a telegram be, chat. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, sorry. I think it would be possible. I just suspect that the reason this hasn't been done is more game theoretic. There's like, there's little reason why you would carry that out that kind of attack as far as I can see. Mm. Well, I think Abi mentioned just to spread out, right? So you don't like that particular project and you want to spread out. I mean, oh yeah, it could happen. But yeah. I don't know, as far as I can tell, most of the projects yeah. that have been doing this have been you know, quite popular. People have wanted yeah. setups. Yeah. I mean, one, one thought that came up and Misha mentioned Telegram and so on. So ceremonies also is kind of a, a name for some for, for, for a protocol that involves humans and uh, human human judgment in a way. And so just kind of this uh, going to the Telegram group and maybe given, being given more slots and how should the humans behave in certain situations. It seems that this, whether, it should, whether this should be part of part of what the ceremony is about. Um, at the moment, we have very formal cryptographic descriptions of how to run a ceremony, but we don't have like a, a social description of how how to make it trustworthy, how to set it up. And uh, and I think that every, every new ceremony initiative um, has to kind of figure that out um, afresh. And uh, I think that is quite a challenge. So so, Markov, I think I wanted to mention that um, I, would, I wouldn't be able to name the exact name. I think it's either Tornado Cache or uh, Aztec, but one of these solutions came up with some automated scheduling procedure. So, um, yeah, so you could you could actually come to the server and then you would be given a slot automatically. Um, and when the server gets the information back, it verifies it. So it, it kind of prevents forks, at least long forks. So, I, actually, I wanted to get maybe this slightly more back on tracks of the standardization. Although these questions are all very interesting practically. Um, so do we have, uh, maybe returning back to Thomas's uh, comment, but Thomas uh, Kerber mentioned that the mind for privacy work. And as far as I remember, it's for updatable, it's for updatable proofs, right? So then- Yes, it is. Um, I, I think it could be extended for, uh, for general ceremony. So, so that's- the, the type two ceremonies you you mentioned, I think it could be extended to those. So that's what I want to mention. I think so. Our definitions capture one phase ceremonies, and they're really very similar. So the one phase ceremonies are still very sequential. Um, and yeah, so if I would expect people to come here and say, well, nobody will do ceremonies anymore. We we should all hope for the you know transparent solutions and so on. But then I would reply that we still need to have one phase ceremony standardized, maybe. But I don't see any people arguing against ceremonies so far. Well, maybe maybe I can argue for a second and say that currently the ceremonies that are being done are two phase ceremonies, right? Um, yeah, well, how does we, it apply? Like Aztec was one phase, and personal powers of Tau is one phase. But Aztec is for something very similar to uh, so it's a range proofs, I think. It would be very similar to what Thomas described, so it would be very similar to uh, universal setup. Yeah. So, do do people here want to have like do people have any motivation to have uh, uh, any description any of these things? So maybe a description of uh, description of the you know most important points that a person arranging a ceremony should take a look at. Um, anything yeah. similar to that? Maybe one question is also, sorry, um, whether it should be a separate kind of standard or should it, whether it should be treated um, in the, the community reference or both? That's, that's what I was going to say. Like, I definitely see the, the value in expanding and adding more sections 
um, to the reference document around this, especially around definitions, around ways to do it, maybe examples, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I'm wondering what, if anything, will be, what will the community get out of a standard given that the field is still really advancing very fast and you know different ceremonies from different schemes are being used and is there like a correct level of abstraction that it will apply to the ceremonies i mean i'm, I'm saying yeah maybe this uh, this framework is that abstraction right but um so so my, my yeah. take would be that it's definitely possible to take a very simple steps to improve the current version of the reference document uh, because it doesn't really describe so we we it, yeah, it's it's fairly easy to give some generalization, which is more than we have in the standard now. Like just describing what the ceremonies looks like, look like what are the you know procedure, what is these, you know what are the functions they call, what is the standard. So the definition that we have, it actually applies to I think all of the all of the ceremonies. So one phase, two phase. It actually it is actually n phase. Um, it supports n phases of ceremony, but I think we haven't yet found any realistic end phase ceremony uh, so far. But uh, what I'm saying is that it's fairly easy to, to generalize what we have already. Um, the point is that do we need, do we have, do we, can we add anything for the practitioners to benefit from, for instance, or for? So with respect to practitioners, I'm not sure if, if, if a non-cryptographer should actually be attempting to do a ceremony securely. Um, I'm not sure if that's something we should encourage. Um, something I have considered, and I'm not sure, I, I guess to some extent Ethereum's uh, single phase ceremony sort of, sort, of, sort of makes sense there, but in, in the case of um, in, in the case of some of these, it, it really is the case that these the outputs of these ceremonies are very reusable because they're just powers of Tau on a certain uh, certain group up to to a certain degree. Um, it, it might even make sense to uh, to standardize a reference string of these. I I, I don't know, but I, I'm not sure if, if this is which class, which or, or maybe there's yes. some uh, for lots of curves. Yes, there's sure. definitely issues there. I, I guess the question is, uh, you know, what what level of a practitioner would you want to target? Um, is, is this someone who's just found some snark libraries and is trying to use them to make something, or so? So one particular answer would be that we are trying to maybe target first of all people who want to use BGM seventeen for something. So that that already happened quite a few times and perpetual powers of Tau, for instance. So what happens now is that apparently if you want to set up a new product that uses uh, growth 16 or any variants, you go to perpetual powers of Tau, then you clone the repository, then you modify it to use the circuit that you want, and then you run that. So there is like some software that can be modified reasonably, uh, but I think it doesn't, it's not very, it's, it's not generic, it's not, yeah, it's not generic uh, to be just used for that. So I think one of the suggestions that we had is maybe it makes sense to at least write a verification tool for um, for a BGM 17, so that you know, like in a, an ideal world with uh, with unicorns, would be that somebody writes a ceremony, then I come to the ceremony and, and ask for a very specific file, and then I would verify this file with the tool that kind of everyone more or less agrees on. Yeah. Um, so 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 my concern is. I don't think ceremonies don't make sense. I think ceremonies are quite sensible in, in, in the situation where you decide you, you need a snark which isn't um, using something that is universal or isn't using something that is transparent. Um, but I think in, in many cases, for people who don't know the details of these ceremonies, it might make more sense to uh, suggest a, a use of something which is transparent, because if you're not going to have a lot of participation in your ceremony, if you're a smaller entity who maybe doesn't have the resources to do it in, uh, in as much depth, then 
you know, I'm not sure if at that point you can really trust the, the, the content of, of the ceremony itself. I don't well, know, I'm, I'm thinking out loud here, so... Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I think I share this concern. Um, perhaps you still can if you have participants, if you participate in that, or you have somebody that you directly trust, and then you can verify the software, then it maybe makes total sense to, to use it. So that, that's, that's the point. So ceremonies seem to be uh, verifiable and trusted. I mean, you, you can trust if, if, if they are as good as they should, uh, they should be fairly good, but it's, it's not trivial to, to make this statement. So if it was, if it was simpler to make the statement of uh, validity of the ceremony, then it would much, uh, you know, the, the, the situation with the whole field, I think would be much, much better if people would, would not be maybe as afraid of the ceremonies. There was a comment in the, in the chat about um, challenges behind that, that, that we actually need more standardization of formats of point compression and so forth to be able to, to do that, right? So, so it's kind of standardization really seems to be important. And uh, yeah, one, one follow-up question I had is that whether, whether there are other situations where, where that is necessary and um, that we have common common formats, common output formats for for snark proofs or for reference strings, for inputs and outputs of, of snark systems. I, mean, I think it's quite common for for the for the circuit representations, but maybe there are other other inputs that need to be standardized. Maybe Antoine wants to. Uh... Yeah, he mentioned that he has a problem with his microphone. Oh, I see. Okay. <laughs> okay, sorry, Anton, for calling you out. <laughs> we're, we're also running into the uh, beginning of the next session. So we probably need to wrap up here. Uh, thank Misha for preparing the uh, discussion. Yep. So and should we say, should we say that like as a next step, um, Maybe you can prepare an addition to the ZK proof community reference um, to improve that section on, so, on ceremonies, trusted setup, like yeah, based so I on think the it's, paper, right? But, yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. I think it's it's definitely what I said. It's definitely fairly easy to to just come to the section and give some more kind of more links and more description, and more general purpose. It already kind of targets BGM seventeen. This um, okay. It targets both protocols, but BGM, BGM 17 mostly. Um, so yeah, it's it won't won't really hurt to expand that a bit. Um, and if you're more ambitious, I suppose people must uh, have a very consistent motivation to agree on it. Yeah, yeah. But uh, thank you, thank you all for listening. Yes. Yeah, so I'm I'm not sure what time should I finish, but I suppose now. Okay. It's right about now. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, that's fine. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, maybe Nikolai, you can take uh, control of the screen.